you don't have a sermon outline, I'd like to ask you to lift up your hand, and these gentlemen will be glad to give you one. Um, you will especially need one this morning. Uh, there are three pages, and it's my, mainly because we're going to be looking at a standalone message out of the book of Romans. We are not starting a new study, but we are going back to one of our key themes in the life of the church. In fact, on the side screens in front of you, you see four key words. Um, the first word is truth. Our church is absolutely founded upon the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So we stand upon the truth, not the things that are relative in our society, but the truths that are eternal. And that comes from God's Word. Worship isn't only singing. We are worshiping when we sing, hopefully. But did you know that you can uh, go to work and worship God while you're at work? You say, you have no idea, Pastor. Um, I, there's no way for me to do it. You don't know the people I work with. Oh, no, it's glorifying to God when you are salt and light in the midst of a world that desperately needs to know who God is. And as you worship Him in your place, uh, by being a great employee, by doing a great job, by learning to be salt and light among them, um, God does a great work. We worship 24-7 in the life of our church. We also have the word community on that outline or on that, uh, uh, that logo. And it's because we believe you don't need a crowd, you need a church. And um, a crowd will come and go, but a church family is designed to be connected and uh, a true community in Christ with one another. And then that last one there, which one have I left out so far? Mission. We are on a mission. We have been given a mission. And so this message this morning focuses really on all three of those above it, but primarily on this picture of mission. And so uh, let me remind you a little bit. This morning you can look and see uh, not only the title that is there, but let me just kind of notice the screen in front of you. The letter to the Romans was written by the Apostle Paul, and it was to the church at Rome. Um, this was a large church. This was a powerful church. Um, notice here with me the, um, the map that is there. We've been looking at Philippi. Um, we've been studying the letter from Philippi. You see that one there in, the, in between really Greece and Turkey um, that is there. But the gospel had been going all through the world of the civilized uh, Mediterranean world at the time. And the church at Rome had become strong. And we're not talking about the Roman Catholic Church. This is long before the Roman Catholic Church. We're talking about the early church, the first century church, um, the, the Apostle Paul and others were ministering to, um, and eventually where he would be in prison. Um, notice the, the next slide here. Not only was the letter written by Paul, but notice this. Paul was a scholar, a pastor, a theologian, an evangelist, but he was most of all what? a missionary. That's what he was really called to be. Um, you say, well, he was an apostle. Y y yes, indeed. He was a called out apostle. The idea of an eyewitness, he had, been, he had dealt with the, the call of the Lord in those things, but he was a missionary. And, and notice this, he, he made waves all through the Mediterranean and paths all over the Mediterranean as he really did three main missionary journeys and then perhaps a fourth. And so, in the course of this, he wrote many letters, he made many visits, he made revisits and revisits again at different times. He directed different preachers like Timothy and Titus to go to different places and many others. And so his letters were very, very important over the last 2,000 years for the church. And so he was a missionary. Now, part of the reason that he wrote the book of Romans was not merely to give us deep theological truths within themselves. Um, there's no doubt that all of Scripture reveals theological truth to us. But we see that the, that the impetus of the letter, that the reason that he initially wrote the letter was as he would be sharing all of the theological depth of, that Romans carries, he was doing it as part of an appeal for the Roman church the church at Rome in the first century, to be involved with God's kingdom's work. So it was a missionary support letter. He was writing a letter asking for them to be fully engaged with the gospel and to be sending people and sending money. 
That was part of the deal. That was part of what was there. Now, this is a little bit surprising because so much of Romans has super rich, deep theological truth, and we're going to see a bunch of that in the first few chapters this morning. But we need to recognize that this theological truth is based upon the call for the church to be involved. So, I, I've entitled this message, Romans, Our Obligation to the Unreached, to those who have been unreached in the world. Two big things that he's really saying in much of the letter. He's saying, we must give sacrificially and we must go willingly. That is really a huge thrust of the reason that he gives us all of the theological truth that he, that he gives us. It is to help us see that God is a sacrificial God who gives of his own son, who gives of himself, and we are called to recognize his work in us, that we are called also to mimic God by giving sacrificially. And think about it, the Lord Jesus came. He went. He, the Lord Jesus was a goer. He was the first missionary. He leaves the halls of heaven to come and save a dying world. And so this morning, as we come to this study, I want us to see this. And I think that you'll notice here as we go, we're going to start off in Romans chapter 1, and um, we will make our way through various, various verses in Romans 1 um, right on through. Now, I think that to this morning is going to be a, uh, a very enlightening thing to us in several different ways. There are some people that are here for the first time or you're new to the life of the church, and you've never been in a church that really reads very much of the Bible. Um, in fact, there might be a verse or two mentioned in a sermon, or the verse may be a jumping off point for the sermon. And then you hear a lot of things said, but not necessarily from the Bible. Well, in the life of our church, we believe that that, that word truth up there is very important, and it comes from God. And what you don't need is to know what Andrew Coleman thinks or somebody else thinks. What you really need to know is what God says. And so we come to the Word, and we want to look deeply at the Word. And so this morning, we're, we're not afraid to read really, really good sections of this. And I believe that what you're going to find is this. You're going to say, wow, that has context. That means something. I can understand that. I'm, I have prayed that that would be the case for you this morning, um, maybe especially for those who have never really read the Bible very much, this is for you. But for Christians, um, I believe that we can be greatly encouraged through the reading of Scripture and as we see um, this unfold in some of these verses. So the first thing that I want us to see is, and you can fill this in, our ownership of the gospel creates obligation with the gospel. If we own the gospel, if, if it comes and it owns us, then we are obligated to the gospel. And that is a lot of what we see in Paul's opening statement here. Romans 1 is the very beginning of the letter, and it shows the salutation at the beginning. And then we see that he's getting right with it, and we see he's, he's telling us that there's an obligation that Christians have. Look at verse 1 up there at the top. It says, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus. So he puts his name at the front, so when you undo the scroll, you can see who's writing it. So Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set, aside, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Verse 3, concerning his son who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the son of God in, a, in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through whom, verse 5, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to, be, to become, excuse me, to bring about, and underline this, the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among the nations. So we start to see this, that, that part of the reason the gospel has been given so that the obedience of faith for the sake of his name, and where? among all the nations. This is the picture. It's for all the world, including you who are called to belong to Christ Jesus. And so this idea that, that the gospel is to be proclaimed. Look at verse 7. Now it's saying, so that was who it's from. Now we see who it's to. He says in verse 7, to all those where? 
in Rome who are loved by God and are called to be saints. Now put out there to the side, this letter is written to Christians. This is to Christians. That's who he's writing to. And he says to them, we see this greeting, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 8, first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you. Sounds like Philippians 1. First, I thank my God through Christ for all of you because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. See, the world is hearing about the faith of this Roman church. Verse 9, for God is my witness who I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son that without ceasing I mention you always in my prayers, asking that somehow by God's will I may now at last succeed in coming to you. So he's saying, I pray for you. We, we often hear these, these things at the beginning of his letters. Uh, we, if you read other Pauline letters, you start to see that he thanks God for them, he prays for them, and he wants to come see them. Look at verse 11. For I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. Verse 12, that is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. I do not want you to be unaware, unaware, brothers, that I have often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented, in order that I may reap some harvest among you as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. Look at verse 14, key phrase. I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. So in this very beginning, we start to see that this is written to Christians who have found the grace of God, who have experienced God's transforming power as becoming God's children, and he's saying, I'm under obligation and you're under obligation. If we've come to Christ, we're under obligation to take the gospel to the nations, to the unreached. And in fact, that's where we are next. Notice what it says here. What does it mean to be unreached? We want to ask ourselves, what it, when we talk about an area that is unreached, you do not currently, this means if you're unreached, you do not currently have access to the gospel. There's no access. These are people who, they don't know someone who is a Christian. They, don't, they can't go find the gospel nearby to them, into their home, in, in their town, or somewhere that is close to them. Notice the next statement. Unless something changes, you will likely be born, live, and die without ever hearing the gospel. That you'll never hear that there is a God who loves you, loves you, who loves you so much that he would come and die, send his son to die on the cross for our sins. Now, the unreached certainly are around us here. We do have people that live just the next street over and people that you work with. Some of you live with folks in your home that um, do not know the Lord. We don't necessarily want to confuse the idea of people who do not know the Lord with the missions term of unreached. Um, in missions language, when we're talking about the unreached, we're talking about people who live in whole societies that there's no one in that society or there's so few in that society that the average person that's walking around, they, they are never going to come in contact with other Christians, that there's just not Christians around them. In fact, some mission organizations say if 2% or less of the populace is are Christians, then we would definitely consider them unreached. You say, that's a, that's a very low bar. And I would say, yes, that's true. Um, but 2% or less means that the average person in that society is not going to ever even perhaps speak with someone who claims to be a Christian. 
700 million people that do not have local churches where they can hear the gospel. 700 million people who have no access to the gospel. How many churches are in along Sheridan Street and in Hollywood that preach the gospel? There's many wonderful churches here in South Florida that preach the gospel. There's churches, I mean, right down Park Road, there's a church, that Presbyterian church that we love that preaches the gospel. Right, right over on US 1, there's another one that preaches the gospel, Sister Church. On Taft Street, there's a beautiful church that preaches the gospel faithfully. And west of here, there's churches all, within 10-minute drive that preach the gospel. Can you imagine being in a city the size of Fort Lauderdale and not one gospel preaching church? Friends, so long as that is the case, the church of America and the church of Europe and the churches where the gospel has prospered, our work is not finished, and we have an obligation. What does it mean to be unreached? It means that the gospel is not near you. It means that you may live your whole life without hearing the gospel unless someone comes and calls you to this. Now, let's notice as well what the, what the passage here in Romans 1, 18, so this is the very next part of that. It says the righteous shall live by faith in verse 17, but then next we come to the fact Excuse that you, you, you have knowledge of the God of the Bible. This, this is what Romans is saying. Um, there's something else that you're not going to have knowledge of. Um, you have knowledge of God. Look what Romans 1, 18 says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Verse 19, for what can be known about God, underline it, is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attribute, namely his eternal power and his divine nature, underline this, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, and then notice what it says, so that they are without what? Excuse. Excuse. So one of the first things that, that Paul is showing us is that, is that the world sees through creation that God exists. The world sees through the human experience that God exists. The fact that a man and a woman can come together and a child is, is propagated. I mean, this is, these are all the things that are like, just amazing truths. We look at biology. We look at the, the creation of the world. We look at the heavens. Um, the reality that there is a creator. It's interesting that in many areas of the world that we would consider primitive or uneducated, the reality of Romans chapter 1 is so much clearer than it is in, quote, unquote, the more enlightened parts of the world. You see, very often our educational enlightenment serves to cause us to reject God that much more. There are many in North Africa and there are many across the Middle East with very little education that if you were to say to them, there is no God, they would just laugh at you. And they would say, well, of course there's a God. They, 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 they understand that very clearly. I think that that's a very interesting perspective that is there. But what else does it mean on the second page there that you see that not only do they know that there is God, but you have rejected God if you're part of the unreached. You say, really, they've rejected God. Yes, look at what Romans chapter 1 verse 21 says. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking. And their foolish hearts were darkened, claiming to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Here's the idea. They, they exchange the reality of the creator for the creation. And throughout human history, we see that human beings have loved to worship everything from birds to beasts to things created with hands. Instead of looking to God, they look to their own gods, which they create, or the things that are part of creation. Look at verse 24. Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts <clears throat> to impurity, 
to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. Because they exchange, underline this, because they exchange the truth about God for what? For a lie. And worshiped and served the what? The creature rather than what? The creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So we, 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 we see that Paul is saying not only did they know God, but they rejected God. Look at the next part. Knowing God and rejecting God means that you stand condemned before God. And Roman, notice this is a very large section of Scripture, Romans 1, 18 through 3, 20, through all the way through chapter 3 and verse 20. Over and over and over again, we see this. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteous men. Verse 24, therefore, we see this over and over, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts, in the lust of their hearts to impurity. Verse 26, for this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. Verse 28, God gave them to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. You see, God was not making them not do those things. They, they are free to do those things. Verse 132 And he says, they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die. They not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Chapter 2, verse 2, we know that the judgment of God, circle that word rightly, rightly falls on those who practice such things. Now, put out there to the side, Andrew Coleman And maybe put your name too. Because this is talking about all of humanity that has sinned against God and rejected God in their hearts as part of the whole system of our humanity. In chapter 2, verse 12, for all who sinned and without the law will perish without the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. So it's saying whether you're a Jew and you know the law or whether you're not a Jew and you don't know the law, all have sinned against God. So, if you're part of the unreached, you have knowledge of God, you've rejected God, you're condemned before God, and look at this next one that really burdens our heart. You have never heard the good news about how you can be saved by God. You're unreached because you've not heard, in part, you've not heard the good news of how you can be saved by God. And this is a glorious truth. Look at Romans 3 and verse 21. It says, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. Verse 22, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. Can you underline that in verse 22? The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. You know what that means? That means if you believe in Jesus as the Messiah, as the one who would pay for your sins, listen to this, God gives you his righteousness. This means God forgives you of your sin and he takes you from being in a state of being guilty before God and condemned, listen to this, to being made righteous. And it's not through your works. It's through his work. This is the good news. You put it out there to the side. The good news of Christ. The good news of Christ is, is that you can trust in him. You can come to him. You can come and hear what God has done to save you. For all, look at the next part here. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as what? Underline that. They're justified by his grace as a, circle that word, gift. Do you, do you do something to earn a gift? No. It's a, it's a gift. It's free. We just, we read a passage of scripture at the opening of our service that talks about the fact that we're, we're called to come to God without money and buy. That means come and receive what God gives. This is the beautiful part of the fact that his salvation is free. It's, it, not only you don't have to earn it, you cannot earn it. 
Notice the next part here, and we see the way this happens. Verse 24, and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. We already saw that already just a little bit. And through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, verse 25, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood. That's a satisfaction. That's a payment, a total paid in full payment. So God puts forward Jesus as the payment to be received by what? By faith. So we receive this payment by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. You know what that last statement means? That means that he is still holy and just. He does not accept our sin. He does not go unjust in the dealing with our sin, but in order to be just, he himself is the justifier, which means that he makes us right with him. This is the nature of the gospel. And how do we receive that? We receive it by faith. Now, if you're unreached, it's because you have knowledge of God through creation, but you have rejected God in your sin. You are condemned by God. Romans makes that very clear. And now we see that you've never heard the good news about how you can be saved by God. Carl F. Henry, a great theologian, made this statement. Look at the bottom there. The gospel is only good news if it gets there in time. You see, the gospel is an urgent matter. This is why the apostle Paul would write things like, make the most of the time, for the days are evil. That he's going to do everything he can. He's running the race with endurance. He's pressing on, pressing on to go to the next place, the next town, seeking to take the gospel to the next people group. And so we are called to see and to hear the great call of God and to obey it. I want us to see in the last page there why we must give and why we must go to the unreached. Why must we give? Why must we go to the unreached? The first thing is all of this is also seen in Romans. The first reason is because of this, because their knowledge of God is only enough to damn them to hell. What they know about God is only enough to, to condemn them. You see, the Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death. The consequence of our sin is death. And that's for the whole world. And there is an eternal hell that is very, very real. And it is a holy God that will not accept a sinful heart. And the only way that it is accepted, it is through the sacrifice of his son. So this is a very stark reality. There's a lot of people that would say, well, pastor, I don't like that. Well, my friends, don't take it up with me. You need to recognize that this is the God of creation that says that I am holy and I reject all that is unholy. I will never accept that which is unholy. But if you'll come to me, I can make you holy. I will make you holy. Look what it says here. Because the gospel of God, secondly, the gospel of God is powerful enough to save them from heaven. This is why we must give. This is why we must go. Revelation chapter 9, verse 10, look what it says. Since therefore now we have been justified by his, by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if we were enemies while we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. And actually that should say Romans, not Revelation chapter 5. So it is God who justifies us. And it is God who justifies us and saves us from hell and gives us the hope of heaven. This is the reason we must go. And not only that, 
Not only the knowledge of God that will send them to hell and the gospel of God that will save them for heaven, but number three, I want you to notice, it's also because the plan of God warrants the sacrifices of His people. The plan of God warrants the sacrifices of His people. That's us. That, that God's plan calls us into action and calls us into action that we would sacrifice and give ourselves for his plan. Jesus came and gave himself for the plan of God, and he calls us to follow in his steps. Romans chapter 10, verse 14, look what it says. How then shall they call upon him, him in whom they've not heard or not believed? And how are they to believe in him with whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach, what does it say there? The good news, the gospel. You see, this is God's plan, that we would be joining with Him in the mission of His plan. This is, this is our privilege in this. And why we must go and how we must give in all of this. Notice the next part here. Because the Son of God deserves the praises of all peoples. The Son of God deserves the praises of all peoples. In Romans chapter 1 verse 5, in the introduction we read earlier, G Paul writes, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of, of faith for the sake of His name among all the nations. You see, it is obedience and praise and magnifying His name across the nations of the world that we have been called to engage. In Romans 16, verse 26, it says, in verse 26, he says, but has now been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith. You see, the obedience of faith is something that brings praise to God. When you are obedient to faith in Jesus Christ, when you are living for God, that is praising Him, that is magnifying Him, that is glorifying Him. And so this is the picture that God's people are called to give and to go for the unreached. Well, how do we apply this in our lives? I believe that the Apostle Paul is saying through all of the picture of the in-depth message of the gospel is that God's people are to respond by giving sacrificially and by going willingly. We are called to give sacrificially and we're called to go willingly. And we're not just talking about going to Africa. We're not just talking about going um, to some foreign land, though that may well be what God is calling you to do. What about going across the street? What about going across the hall? Going next door? We, we look at this and we, we look at the issue of being locally involved with what God is doing. We, we, we've talked about who's your one and we're praying for people that, that are close to us. I, I don't know if you have a name on these boards. I, I want to encourage you to be thinking and praying. Just, just even one, if you would just do one where you are thinking and praying for them. Not only that, but perhaps you need to be involved with the conversational evangelism seminar, that, that God would, would help you grow in this, that you would apply yourself to this. And, you know, you would say, well, I would, I would say something to someone about my faith in Christ if I knew what to say. Well, the question is, have you lifted a finger to figure out what to say, to be taught what to say? I, I want to encourage you to, to be starting to see the, the people that are around you as immortal souls that are going to live forever, and they're going to either live in the forgiveness and grace and glory of God, or they're going to live in being shut out from God and condemned by God, and that God wants to use you in the lives of others. And it's, it's amazingly through the feeble words that we have that the eternal God speaks through us. 
and that he does things that you would never believe to those, to those who just trust him and start to grow in this and start to say, man, I want to be used by God. I don't want to go through this life having never been used by God. I want to do what he's called me to do. Notice on your outline here, we say community group outreaches. And what about the ministries of Sheridan Hills to children, to youth, to Sheridan Hills Christian School? We have families here from the school. We're so excited about that. The fact that God is using our school to help people come and hear the fact that they can be forgiven by God, that, they, that God came and he laid down his life for them. There's, there's families here that have come to faith in Jesus, come out of religion and into relationship. Maybe if you're new to us this morning, we just want to say we, we're a church that really do, dislikes religion. We don't like religion. Um, we believe that religion will take you merrily to hell. It'll take you happily, very willingly to hell. But what you need is a relationship with God, and that comes through one way, not through your works, but through his work and his work on the cross as he died on the cross for our sins and rose again, overcoming all of our sin, death, and shame. What about the other things? I, I, I think about our special outreach events. I think about Easter we're coming up on Easter. In fact, right now in the pew sides, there are baskets. Would everybody just grab one of the baskets and send it down the pew? Um, if, if you see one of those, take a group of those cards. Marcy, can you hand me that? Um, thank you. Notice this. There are packets of cards. There's five or six cards in each one. And if you all don't have one, you can pass it along. I want to encourage you to take some of these. Put them in your purse. Put them in your, in your car. Put it in your whatever it is you got your man purse. Um, you guys have man purses? I've seen, a, well, yeah, Merce. Put it in your Merce. Sounds, you know. I mean, we are obligated to go to people who do not know Christ. Some people would say, well, you know, aren't the people here in South Florida, aren't they unreached? I mean, all these people that I work with in my office, and, and, and I would say this, no. They're not unreached. You're there. You're, you're there to reach them. You're the one who can share with them. I mean, there's, it's, it's the opportunity that God has given us. But there are people who live on places of the world where it's not saturated with three centuries of Christian gospel, like our culture is. And there's no one there to do that. And so this message is local, but this message is also global. And so we, we need to continue to think about all of the different ways that God has called us to go globally. Today, I wear a shirt that says IMB on it. And that stands for International Mission Board. And that is the organization that Southern Baptist churches support to send over 3,000 missionaries around the world. This morning, there are 3,500 missionaries and about 4,000 of their children, over 7,500 people living overseas. And 46,000 Southern Baptist churches take offerings every single Sunday and take an offering called the Lottie Moon Christmas Offering in December, and we keep those missionaries on the field. And so as we give, this is part of keeping missionaries going to the hard places of the world. And let me tell you that supporting the IMB is very strategic, and it's very strategic because of this. The IMB is committed to going to the last reached places, the places where it's really hard to get folks in there and keep them in there. You know, I love Brazilians. I love Brazilians so much I married one. But... Quite honestly, we don't need to send more missionaries to Brazil very often. There are so many Baptists, and there are so many Presbyterians, and there are so many Methodists, and there are so many evangelical Presbyterians or, or, excuse, Christians in Brazil that the Brazilians can reach the Brazilians at this point. Now, we love them, we pray for them, we support them, and sometimes we might be involved with them in some ways doing missional work, but we are really focused on those last frontiers where there are no Christians to say, there is a God who loves you. There is a God who sent his son. There is a God who paid the price for you. 
Now, my friends, I, I just want to say that as we give to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering and as we give each Sunday and we give to the cooperative program, that that's part of what we do. But we also give to, like a, in March, a missions offering. And we believe that it matters that people are going to support missionaries that are there, to take care of their kids and to make sure that their kids feel like they are hearing the gospel from somebody besides their mom and dad. That's why that mission trip is successful or strategic. If, if these kids are not well supported, if someone is not speaking their language, speaking the gospel in their language, listen, mom and dad wind up coming off the field. And mom and dad who have learned to speak Arabic or Farsi or some other Persian language or some other Central Asian language or North African tongue, suddenly they're back in Atlanta or they're back in Tennessee or they're back in Wisconsin when they could be on the field, but it was because their kid was struggling. That's why it's important that we go and take care of those MKs, those missionary kids. Project Northern Lights. There, there's, we've lived in North Africa. We've seen that there's village after village after village, city after city after city, and not one believer that is known. And yet God is working and he's calling believers out of that darkness. And we've seen him do it a thousand times where, where there's people that come through the port gates and someone hands them a Bible and they put it in their sack and they take it back with them and they're in a taxi headed down through the desert, headed back to their town and they start reading and the Holy Spirit starts speaking and they come to faith in Jesus. Now, I could tell you stories till tomorrow morning about that, and I would love to, but I just want you to see and hear this morning that we as Christians are called to go and we're called to give. We're called to go willingly, happily, joyfully, and we're called to give sacrificially, perhaps so others can go. I want to say that everybody that's going on these teams, they're all given all they can to support themselves on the trips. So it's not like we're just sending them on their own. They're, they're being required to give everything that they can. In fact, some of them are saying, well, I'm gonna work another job. I'm going to do another thing. I'm doing these projects to have, have more that I can contribute. And so we're, we're giving sacrificially and we can all give sacrificially because that's what we see the Apostle Paul saying to the Romans, hey, may we send funds so that the gospel can keep going. Now, notice also on your outline there, I want you to notice this, that sometimes, and back up just one more there, Alex, I want you to see these, these at the bottom. Short-term mission trips, that's part of what we're talking about, that's one to eight weeks. Mid-term mission trips. Now, I, I want to look at this for just a second. The journeyman program with the IMB is designed for college graduates, uh, men or women, and even married folks, to be able to go for two years. That's what it's designed for. It's designed for you to say, well, you know, we have this opportunity and um, it's after I've graduated and I wanna go. Um, that's a short-term commitment, a two-year commitment. Notice the next one, the master's program. You know who that's for? People 50 years and up. The master's program is for people who say, you know, I've been able to retire early or I can take off some time. Or, you know, maybe, maybe we retired at 65. One of my friends joined the master's program. He was one of our elders at Crescent Beach Baptist Church. He joined the master's program, and he and his wife, he was a retired professor, 70 years of age, he and his wife moved to England to set up a language school, and the language school was made for Middle Easterners. And so the language school was there teaching Middle Easterners to speak English, and we were sharing the gospel with, through that school. And that, and that school opened doors for us to send people to the Middle East as workers, as Christian workers. And so here was a couple who used his being a professor, his credentials, to set up a school, and he spent two years working in England. I, I just want you to see that there's no limit to what God may use you to do. Um, there are journeymen, there's master's program, and then look at the last one there. It's long-term career missionary, and that's what Marcy and I were before the Lord cut our long-term short. Um, we had served nearly 10 years overseas, 
and God said, it's time for you to come home. Um, But there are other missionaries. There's missionaries from our church that have been on the field 37 years that we support every Sunday, that we are praying for. There's others that have been on the field for eight or 10 years. The Shalavas are going to be coming home this summer after being overseas, I think, for 11 or 12 years. So these are, these are ways in which we are to be faithful in this. So friends, when we talk about supporting and praying for the gospel going to the unreached, we are talking about very practical ways you can do that. Now, it's from the homeless ministry in Hollywood. It's from Hope Women's Center in Hollywood. It's from Sheridan House in Hollywood. It's for other things that we do right here in Hollywood, maybe through your community group right here in Hollywood, reaching out to your neighbors, inviting them to church, talking to them about the gospel, having them over for dinner, beginning a gospel conversation with the people right here at home. And it's going to the far corners of the earth where Jesus has said, you will take my gospel to the remotest parts of the earth. And when the gospel has been preached to the remotest parts of the earth, the scripture says the end will come. Now, my friends, we need to get busy busy because I'm ready for the new phase. I want to get to the new phase of the incoming and getting to the time of restoration. I I look forward to the day when there is going to be a glorious kingdom and there's no more sin and there's no more sorrow, there's no more sickness, there's no more tears, and there's no more death. And so we are to be busy in the Lord's kingdom work. We are to be busy giving our lives. May we not sit and and simply allow these days to go by without being maximized. So friends, I, I ask you and I call upon you to pray and to give and to go as a church. Now here's, here's the deal. The Apostle Paul is saying to the Romans, and he's saying to Sheridan Hells, that this idea of giving sacrificially and going willingly is not an option. It is an obligation. We are obligated. We have been given the gospel. This is not a joke. We are obligated to do this. If we are true Christians, we are called to take the gospel to the nations. I'm going to ask if you would to stand with me and put your eyes on the screen. I want you to read Jesus' final words on the earth with me. We've read this a thousand times if you're a Christian for very long. This is called the Great Commission. This is called the Great Instruction. This is God's instruction to us as his people. Jesus was there there gathered outside of Galilee. A bunch of his followers were there. He had already risen from the dead. And then when it was time for him to ascend to the Father, he looks at his disciples And he says these words, and then he is taken up saying, I'm going to come again. But look, notice what he says, and let's read it out loud together. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. This is what he's called us to do. Let's pray together.